Hi, my name is Josh Fitzgerald. I'm uh, the current collections historian for the Gertrude Bass Warner Collection here at the University of Oregon. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, some of the projects that I worked on in this position uh, and the collection, Warner, her, her life, and uh, some of her, her philosophy as a collector uh, from the early 1900s. To begin with, um, uh, when I first uh, began this project, I, I noticed how disparate uh, the collection was. Its presence online was uh, pretty much separated at a bunch of different sites. The museum had its own website. Uh, CAPS and all of its helpful information was on its own website. And then uh, UO Libraries had a few websites with that discussed the collection. And uh, I, I knew right away that there was a, a, a chance to make a, a central location, a, a digital hub, to discuss the collection, to, to, dis, to talk about the merits of the collection, and to bring more attention to the collection. And so I, I began by uh, designing the, the UO blog, Warner in the World, uh, which you can go to today um, and uh, take a look at some of the projects that I completed. And these included um, uh, working on blog posts, just in, entries that uh, described the research that I was conducting on the collection. Uh, then I also made uh, visualizations of, uh, of her life and some of her work, so uh, timeline and some social network maps and uh, described um, events that were taking place and made announcements for uh, interested faculty and students at the University of Oregon to attend. And uh, I worked on K-12 programming uh, and designing educational opportunities for, for, future, uh, for teachers for the future. And to begin with, um, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the materials that are here at the library um, and those available on Oregon Digital and through SCUA. And you can go and visit today Special Collections and, and find a lot of her materials, her, her set of uh, diaries and letters, the correspondence. There's just boxes and boxes of material there, uh, physical material. But Oregon Digital's philosophy in, in, uh, in digitizing a lot of this material uh, is to bring this these these items, these physical objects, directly into the hands of, of students and researchers. And uh, interested researchers can go to Special Collections today and find the, the physical objects there. There's a set of her diaries, um, chock full of information, uh, her letters, correspondence to other collectors, and the items that she brought back from her travels in Asia. She lived in Asia for uh, 10 years of her life early on. Um, she met and married her husband there. And they began collecting and, and documenting their time there. And then afterwards, she went back and, and documented information in, in a set of diaries. And you can go there and see them. Or you can go online and find these high-resolution uh, images. Some of the items that you'll find include the letters that she wrote to other collectors, uh, this example of a map uh, from a Buddhist shrine that she visited, and itineraries of the shrines that she visited. She was studying Shintoism and Buddhism in uh, Japan, and, and she studied Chinese uh, different um, uh, sacred places in China and and so you can find all these objects there and they're the, online these these images are high quality you can zoom in really close and so it's a really great um, research opportunity for for students who are interested and when you get to Oregon Digital's website you can do some uh, really easy searches to find key terms that you're looking for and I find that some of the more interesting things are the anecdotal moments from her diaries. And these include events such as when she arrived in Katsura in 1919. Uh, it was a really soggy arrival. She, she showed up uh, with her fellow companion, uh, a female uh, traveler who was also collecting at the time. They arrived in Katsura to uh, a torrential downpour. And their, their porter, a Japanese man, uh, was lugging their, their materials on a rickshaw through the rain to the nicest hotel in town. And when she realized that the hotel was full and they didn't have any room in the inn, uh, she, she also realized that the porter was dropping their stuff off at the destination he would brought them to. And, uh, and this was not okay with her. She wasn't about to be left in the middle of the rain in, this, in the middle of the city. So she walked over to him, and in her diary she claims that she grabbed him by the sleeve and forcefully told him in English that he needed to stick around and carry her luggage throughout the city until they found a place to stay. And, and supposedly, awe-stricken and, and quietly, he, he did so throughout the rest of the, the, that, um, that initial trip. And these type of stories are actually really... Um, interesting uh, windows into uh, a Western traveler. You know, 
assuming so much about her place, her position, and what she had the uh, authority to tell other people, this, this porter in Japan. And I like to bring those stories to students' attention to talk about uh, the potential for research into looking at Westerners traveling at the time. Uh, I, I bring up different images that she collected, like here, this uh, lantern slide of Osaka in the rain. And I talk about the environmental uh, uh, atmospheric elements that you capture from her, her diary entries. And then some of the other things you might not expect to find in the images, the uh, examples of modernity that you can see uh, in the background here, the, the electri electrification of, uh, of Osaka, Japan, at this, at this time. When you look at her collection, uh, she was trying to do a lot of uh, educational work. As someone who brought a lot of material to uh, the university early on, she helped to uh, engender the Asian Studies program here. And uh, the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies is one of these uh, outgrowths over all, you know, decades of people studying Asia and Asian art. And that's all due to some of the work that Gertrude Bass Warner did early on. And so I, you know, I talk to students about some of the opportunities that come along with studying uh, Asian uh, history, culture, and art here. And I, I talk to them about funding opportunities, um, the financial incentives. But also I, I talk about if they have interest later on in becoming an educator, we do have a group working on K-12 through programming that um, develops uh, act activities you know, for the classroom and lesson plans. And I, I, I want to make them aware that uh, these materials are, are available for them so that there is a, it, there is a, a way of uh, following, continuing on to the study that they're doing in Asian studies and bring that into uh, uh, local and, and national classrooms. And so while I'm introducing them to this uh, educational aspect of Gertrude Bass Warner's life, I like to also talk to them about the history of her uh, anchoring herself here in, in Eugene. And uh, you know, while I worked on this collection, I, I found the Oregon News um, website to be very helpful. You can search through those newspapers very easily. And you can find a lot of information about her history. And for example, one of the early uh, stories about her life here in, in Eugene comes from the Sunday Oregonian. And it's this really interesting story of her showing off her wares to President Lucian here at the university and how she really uh, demonstrated the need for uh, an Asian art collection here. And this happened in 1920 when there wasn't an art museum to speak of here. Uh, the collection was housed at Gerlinger Hall at the, in the Women's Memorial Hall uh, for uh, to almost 10 years until the construction of uh, the Jordan Snitzer Museum. And you can see here her donning uh, one of her very precious uh, Chinese imperial coats for an audience uh, to, to take pictures of. And so this early work um, on the part of Warner uh, really situated a, a place for Asian art here. She went in and uh, actually helped to design the um, Jordan Snitzer Museum with uh, Professor Lawrence, the architecture uh, professor and architect. Through the collection talks that I've given here at the university, I highlight some of the course topics and themes. Uh, so in a course on modernity, I, I bring up those examples that I talked about from Osaka. Uh, for courses on gender studies, I, I highlight her and her, her role. But I, one thing I think is most valuable is just learning from the students um, from these uh, at moments of adv advocacy and outreach. It gave me a lot of uh, helpful feedback from the students where they talked about using Oregon Digital and, uh, and my website and some of the questions that they had. I think this type of uh, outreach is really uh, one of the goals that Warner had, had pursued from the very beginning. And this is something that the Jordan Center Museum also is working on. They've got their online um, uh, presence is, is, was well established, but they continue to do work on their collection and the, the data that is um, that is searchable online so that when researchers are looking online at some of these physical objects at the Jordan Center Museum that are part of the Murray Warner collection of Asian art, they can find what they're looking for, but they can also find uh, examples of, of material that are not necessarily associated with uh, those particular objects. And so it actually adds, it adds in a layer of, of research uh, finding that, it, that only comes with some of this digital uh, research work. 
And it was through looking through their collection that it inspired my K through 12 uh, digital exhibits. And this one focused on uh, Chinese uh, bridal apparel and, and what Warner found to be interesting elements of Chinese domesticity and, and etiquette when she was living there in the 19, uh, early 1900s. She lived there from 1904 to 19, uh, 1909. And uh, while she was there, she uh, lived in Shanghai. And one of my blog posts uh, tackled this topic, but I wanted to add a little bit to that. I've designed a digital exhibit that showcases some of the, the, the ways that Warner displayed some of these textiles, these uh, skirts, aprons, um, and, and other bridal apparel to inspire teachers to, to use these materials and, and, and her view to, to educate students in, in, in the practices of um, museum, early museum specialization and how uh, the public in Eugene might have first learned about some of these practices. And I think that this helps when um, some of the local schools come in and, and look at the objects at the, at the Jordan Sitcher Museum. They can have a little bit more content and a little more um, of, a, of a connection to some of these materials and, and the way they were originally presented. And now finally, I'll, I'll just want to end with two specific collections that um, I think are really helpful tools for educators, for researchers. And first I'll start with the um, lantern slides. And this is a collection of 5,000 plus uh, images that some of which Warner took herself, but also her son, Sam Warner, who had, uh, was a law professor here at one point, and uh, her husband, Murray Warner, had taken uh, from 1909 to roughly uh, the 1930s. And some of these images uh, depict um, daily life activities, uh, ceremonial activities, uh, different customs that um, are then colored in by, a, by an artist and, and are put into one of the earliest forms of a projection screen, uh, the, the magic lantern. And with light behind them, they were thrown against the wall. And you can see uh, how Warner might have used some of these to educate the public uh, her friends and, and other uh, socialites um, living in Oregon at the time, she would display these for them and, uh, and talk about some of the, the personal experience she had while living and, and studying in Asia. And I, I use these slides to show students not only how this practice might have taken place with Warner at the head of it, but also to show them what sort of uh, research opportunities are there uh, just hidden in plain sight. Um, adding these type of visual sources to your research endeavors I think is a, a really great way to enliven uh, what you're presenting to uh, other people. And now I'll turn to another component of the Gertrude Bress Warner collection and that's the Nosatsu, the votive slips that are, are a prized uh, part of her collection here at the at the library. In special collections we have tens and thousands of these um, these slips, these little paper slips. And they represent a, a really fascinating moment in, in Japanese culture. Craftsmen would uh, create these woodblock prints and, and they were personalized um, objects uh, with their names and, and uh, particular images um, that they would showcase. And we have just volumes of, of these uh, albums upstairs that uh, you can take a look at. And, but then the process of digitization is really going to transform the way that you can look at these. You can zoom in really close and not have to worry about damaging uh, some of these priceless objects. And uh, one thing that's really fascinating that, that I find fascinating about going through these the physical objects is the fact that on some of the backs of these votive slips there are pieces of shrines. Uh, because at the time uh, in the early uh, 1900s and in the end of the, of the 19th century people would paste these on shrines to signify that they had come to this sacred place and it's sort of a way of marking I was here and this over time they started using an adhesive that was very sticky um, not like a, a rice paste that they would use before that was more natural and they would remove them or when they would be removed it would actually pull off parts of the, sh of the shrine and so you can see on the back of some of these some actual wood grain which is really interesting to think that some of uh, parts of, of, a, of a sacred shrine that Gertrude uh, visited one day. She actually brought back and, and they sit upstairs. Warner purchased much of this collection from Frederick Starr, uh, a Nasatsu fan, and he's depicted here in the 
uh, in a form of uh, Nosatsu, which is a cartoonish version of him. But you can also find, if you keep researching on Warner's collection, depictions of him in the lantern sites too. There's many of him uh, traveling through Korea. So we have a lot of Korean uh, photographs, and, uh, and he's just part of those. And I like to bring these Nosatsu to the classroom and, and show uh, some of these examples, not only do they capture personal information like names and, and a personal symbol, but they, they're full of information that can be pulled apart. Uh, for example, there's these uh, votive slips that show signs of modernity. You can see here uh, train tracks and, and, and different uh, uh, new elements to society that the artists are trying to capture in these woodblock prints. But now to, to end with, I'd, I'd like to leave these two images here for you and just to talk a little bit about Warner's legacy uh, here at the University of Oregon. And you, so you can see here in the Nosatsu on the left here and, and the lantern slide on the right. And I think by showing these two images, and I especially like to do this for students to let them talk about this uh, with each other and have a discussion. It, what I find interesting is the different depictions of, of nostalgia here the way that these images actually show layers of information. So for the Nosatsu, we have the depiction, this classic depiction of a, the warrior tattoos, right? The body is full of these uh, inked over tattoos. And on the right, we have a real historic image of the same. And I think by looking at both these images uh, together and also considering the context of what Warner was uh, living through and the, the period that she was from, I think you find a lot of what Westerners see when they looked in at Japanese culture and then also how, how Japanese artists and photographers depicted themselves for a wider audience. And so you have these layers of, of research that, that students and, and researchers, scholars can take apart. And that's, that's hopefully uh, one of the takeaways that you'll have when you start to work with the collection. So I'll end here, and hopefully I've inspired you to take a look at the Gertrude West Warner collection, especially the online materials at Oregon Digital, and thank you very much for your time.